Hey, Naomi. Hey, Charles. Hi, Naomi. How you doing, John? Good, thank you. Okay. We're waiting. Yes, we are. <laughs> you know, the closer we get to the holiday, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah. And, and today's the day that people will be shopping, preparing, traveling. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 It's it's just kind of, it is what it is, you know? It is what it is, yes. <laughs> to be expected. 
Hmm. Which is uh, kind of too bad, actually, because got some interesting, interesting stuff for yeah. you guys to think about over the break here. And, you know, hopefully with you guys having, well, you'll, what, you'll have like after today, you'll have four days. You know, somewhere within that four days, I'm thinking most of you could pick up a paintbrush, you know. I, I'm hoping to. <laughs> yeah. I want to. I haven't gone back yet, but I I want to tell you I want to do some more of that uh uh wet uh, graphite. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, actually I was gonna I was gonna try to find some of the drawings that I had done earlier, but I was actually kind of contemplating because I've got some graphite here with me, um, uh, actually doing a uh step by step demo and then uh documenting it yeah yeah to share you know right and walk you guys through the process so uh you know now i got some uh sandpaper pads is that the best to use to uh sharpen them <laughs> um i just use like a regular electric pencil sharpener but i got the big wide mm -hmm. uh sticks so it won't fit in the pencil sharpener yeah the pens the regular pencils i use in the pencil sharpener but mm -hmm. these so are you're, you're these saying are, like the big fat crayons right yeah 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 i don't bother sharpening those period and the reason i don't sharpen them is you know i use them basically for big broad sort of gestural strokes okay like that and to like lay on their side and and you know if i break them you yeah. know to you know put in like large masses right of value um but would the sandpaper work uh, for sharpening them yeah you could um and and as you sharpen them you save all the dust right that's it i understand that yeah because i know they sell the powdered uh, graphite right. yeah yeah but you could save that dust and then you can actually apply it either with your fingers or with a brush. Right. And wet it and then push it around as well. So, right. yeah. So don't don't let that end up in the garbage can. because No, I already thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. One good thing in my memory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a useful, you know, it's a useful tool. Um, and particularly for laying in, you know, big general tones and stuff yeah. like that. It works really well. So, yeah, so yeah, hopefully I will be playing around with that this weekend sometime. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, I look forward to seeing, you know, what you're doing with it. Hey, Eloise. Earth calling Eloise. <laughs> yeah, I think she's... Uh -huh. She's, she's probably, I don't know, she may be on her phone. Um, at any rate, let's, uh, let's move forward, okay? And uh, get this puppy rolling since we're six minutes after the hour now. Uh, so I lined up a couple of videos for you guys to watch. And uh, the first thing I'm going to play is I'm actually going to play a video on a woman who is doing an a la prima painting. And uh, her name is Claire Bowen. She's an English artist. Uh, she's actually come to the U.S. a couple of times to participate in a series of workshops, things like that. Um, hmm, Eloise went away. <laughs> At any rate. Um, but she has a very nice, simplified style you know, which is very broad, very painterly, and, um, you know, just really nice the way she lays in shapes and values, and, uh, you know, now that she's working in oil, um, so obviously it doesn't translate directly to watercolor, the same process, but the same ideas do, okay, so uh, I'm going to start that, and then um, we will go from there.
Good morning. Morning. How you doing, Eloise? Good. I couldn't get any sound. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what we figured. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you got sound now. We can All righty. Okay. Um, you, you probably missed a little bit of this, but uh, the artist that we're looking at is Claire Bowen. She's an English artist. And uh, this is a real quick little a la prima uh, demonstration. And uh, I just kind of want you to watch her go through her process. She has a very simplified uh, approach and style to a la prima painting. But, uh, you know, she, she brings up a lot of really good points. So uh, we're going to take a, a look at and just kind of watch her go through the process. It's, it's interesting to see how this develops. Claire Bowen, and I'm going to be doing a oil painting demo. Yes, you are. Okay, let's start her at the very beginning. Hello, this is Claire Bowen, and I'm going to be doing a oil painting demo of lemons and a Japanese bowl. Do subscribe to my channel if you like this video. I started with burnt sienna and yellow ochre and drew out with a stubby brush. I mixed cadmium yellow, scarlet red, and cerulean blue for the shadows of the lemons. I squinted my eyes to see where the shadows were on the lemons. Next was the leaves and I used the same colors that I've used on the lemons, which helps with the color harmony. Uh, doing the darkest areas first and adding more cadmium yellow for the lighter areas of the leaves. Using quite a uh, flat, big brush to get uh, nice shapes, not worrying too much or anything about detail at the moment. I added a little bit more cadmium yellow and scarlet red to warm up the leaf as well. Back to the lemons, I'm doing the area that's in light. I mixed. Uh, lemon yellow and cadmium yellow, a little titanium white. Just put in the shapes, uh, that is the light side. Again, squinting my eyes to see where the light areas are. There's no tonal graduation at this point, but I can come back to that. Next is the bowl. I used uh, ultramarine, burnt sienna and a little cadmium yellow. I want it to be really dark to go uh, contrast against those lemons. I place the bowl and the lemons quite high, almost eye level, uh, and it gives a nice shape of that bowl on the side. And the composition works well with the lemons poking out the top. Um, I just use my brush in different angles uh, to make it interesting, um, making sure I get the shape and the symmetry of it as well. For the stalks of the lemons, I used a Sterling Pro Art round brush and held it right at the end quite loosely just to get a kind of a natural shape, um, working through all three of them. And then I wanted to do the background and I did some trials of colours and tonal values to see what they were like. It's the same three colours, the cadmium yellow, scarlet red and cerulean blue. Uh, but using more white and more blue in it and as you can see that was a little bit dark so i rubbed it out okay i want us to stop this for just a second and point out in every one of the color mixtures that she's men mentioned so far okay uh it's always been a combination of the three primary colors red yellow and blue in whatever mixture that is now in one she used burnt sienna Obviously, burnt sienna is a very muted and somewhat darker red. Um, you know, it's really neutral, so it's considered an earth tone. Um, and she used that with, uh, I think she said ultramarine, you know, for yeah. the dark on the bowl. And, and that really made, you know, her one of her strongest darks. Okay. But, you know, everything else, she's using scarlet either cad yellow or lemon yellow, and and then cerulean blue, which is a lighter value blue. And, you know, she's getting most of her, you know, most of her shadows and her, uh, even her lights, you know, at that point. 
uh, have just a little touch of all three of those. So uh, what's really absent up until this point, <laughs> excuse me while I sneeze, or try to, um, what's absent is white. You know, she's not putting any white in these mixtures until she started making that gray for the background. But everything else, you know, it's pretty much so those those three, you know, primary colors. And she's using all three of them to some degree to modify the color. Okay. What, what about scarlet and red? I don't think I've heard of that. Is that like cat red? Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little less orange. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little, it's not as cool as like a alizarin. Um, you know, but it tends to be like a very bright, very sort of intense red. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cad, Cad tends to be a little bit on the orange side. Mm -hmm. So I thought Scarlet would be more orangey too. No. Um, now there's uh, Vermilion. Uh -huh. Have you heard of, heard of Vermilion before? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's more orange than a Cad uh, red but it's not as orange as say a cadmium orange you know so it it falls into that red orange uh kind of spectrum of color okay i'll have to look for that okay yeah yeah there's a variety of them you know there's probably about you know a good 30 or 40 different reds out there that you could choose mm -hmm. um you know if 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 i were to advise you as to what reds to having your palette, mm -hmm. you know, so that you could do a variety of things. Um, you know, uh, instead of a lizard and crimson, I, I would go to a permanent rose. And the reason that I would do that is that the permanent rose is not as dark and cool and or as opaque as the alizarin. Okay, the alizarin is really not opaque, but it's in comparison, you know, mm -hmm. it, it it has more covering power to block stuff out. The uh, permanent rose is slightly lighter in value, but far more intense in color and gives you that kind of cooler red spectrum. Uh, so if you needed to shift it into some violets and things, you can really make some very nice uh, very intense violets and things out of it. So I find it to be more useful than alizarin. Um, the next red that I pretty much so can't live without is uh, cadmium red, medium. And I use a medium. A lot of people go to the light, mm -hmm. um, but depending on the, on the manufacturer, uh, some of the cad red lights tend to almost for me feel more like a vermilion you know they they get a little too orange um where the the cadmium red medium seems to be a good strong you know bright red now if i can't find cadmium red medium then a uh, a scarlet mm -hmm. uh, red would work um and then Either a, you know, you could go, well, you know, if I if I had a scarlet, then I probably would have a cad red light. And then I would go with a cad orange or a vermilion, either one of those two. All righty. Okay. And, you know, if you're doing portraits in particular, those three reds, the, uh, the, the permanent rose, the cad red, and then the uh, cad orange, mm -hmm. you know, and or the vermilion, are all really useful colors, you know, for mixing flesh tones. And the reason being is that you know they they tend to be fairly intense, and when you mix them down, um, you know they still hold a lot of uh, intensity in the color, without getting too great down too fast. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Added some more titanium white to it. I used a flat hog brush 
uh, and did it in all different directions, up and down, um, just covering the areas in a loose way. And uh, then once I got to uh, like the leaves, to making sure that I sculpted around them, uh, not leaving any whites. Uh, once I got... I want to stop here too to mention um, where her camera is seems to be uh, lower than her actual eye level. Uh, where her eye level is and the way that she paints this uh, she can see more of the top of the table than we can see, you know, in our view, because I think the camera is set just a little bit low. So so where the horizon lines fall and things like that are not quite the same in the final painting as what we're viewing, you know, here in the video. On the left side, I made it a little bit lighter in tonal values, adding more titanium. The shadows, I used the same color as the mold again. Just getting the shapes in um, that I could see under the bowl and under the lemon. Next was the background kind of basic color of the, um, the tablecloth. And I just used a warm light color um, with some cadmium yellow and scarlet red and a little of the, the blue again just to, to bring used a uh, mid tonal value to go between that light and dark on the lemons, um, adding a little of the cerulean uh, to cool it down as well. I'm not trying to blend them all together. I want the planes to stand out. Uh, I just wanted to make sure it looked rounded. And then adding any little highlights uh, on the end of the lemon that I saw and using the rigger brush to pick up the lights on the stalks and the leaves. Using titanium, lemon yellow, and scarlet uh, with some thicker paint um, and a flat brush, I put in the tablecloth lights, uh, variating them with more yellow um, as I went and adding some blue as well to cool it down if needed, uh, but making sure it's nice and thick. So now that leaf, although that was the right shape, I didn't like it. It was a bit kind of clunky. So I used a old hanky. Uh, which is my rag, and just um, wipe some of it out so I could sculpt back in with the uh, background colour of that grey um, just to work in to make the shape nicer, more pleasing. Um, and then I use the lighter colour um, as well from the tablecloth, which also then you know, I put it up to it and it brought the horizon up to that level and it seemed to work the shape worked better which I was pleased about um, so then I was just making sure the line of that table was right um, and also going up against the bowl so it makes the shape I can kind of go back into it and make the shape nice also with those ends of those leaves um, I then added a little bit of um, darker green to the sides of those leaves, um, making sure that it, it reds to have a light and dark, um, and making sure those points were good. Next, I added the vein, and I used a rigger brush. Um, I think it's a number four Rosemary & Co. Ivory rigger, really useful brush. Um, and using either a lighter or a darker to make the vein stand out. So working on the edges, um, either they're soft or hard, uh, make sure there's no gaps as well. The highlight of the, on the lemons is with titanium white and lemon yellow using um, a soft brush but really loaded with paint and um, making sure it really stands out thick. Finally the bowl, uh, making sure it's symmetrical and adding a little light as well on that side. Also adding the highlight on the top with a little bit more uh, titanium in there. So that's it. 
thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this and do subscribe to my channel. Okay. So just take a minute and, and take a look at this uh, really carefully. And I guess uh, anybody got any thoughts? One way or the other? All right. Are you all right? Yes. Is that a yes? I uh, was just looking at what it's got now. Okay. Yeah. Like it? Don't like it? I don't know about the uh, not blending. Uh, wow. <laughs> okay. He's all right. Um, well, again, you know, that's that's kind of a stylistic uh, choice. Uh, as she, as she was saying, you know, she's what she's actually trying to do is she's trying to differentiate in the in the value changes, right? The, the different planes of the lemon and yeah it it makes kind of a blocky looking painting when you're close up like this but when you step away it all kind of falls together and if if you look at the painting by somebody uh and i think we we looked at him yesterday the day before uh like uh, vasquez right all right spanish artist he yep. painted very much so like this, you know, and and uh, and his pieces, you know, he would make, you know, he would make more transitions in color, but you know, he wouldn't take a lot of time to blend them together, so it was one value sitting next to another, you know, that helped him turn the form, and you know, where she only used like three steps really four, because uh, she used a shadow, a mid-tone, a light, and a highlight. You know, he probably would have used like six, and I would recommend at least five, okay? So she could have found maybe, uh, for example, like on the shadow, she could have picked up some of the reflected lights, and that would have softened the overall effect by just having that one more transition in there uh than she did but again um you know for a study and you know even just you know if somebody likes really painterly uh type work you know this this would definitely appeal to them um you know for me you know there's places i could go with this uh, playing with warmer and cooler temperatures um, and maybe a few more steps in value. And, you know, you could really flush this out and and heighten the sense of realism about it considerably. Um, but still, you know, it's a very nice painting. And the thing is, um, and she didn't talk a lot about it, but the thing that kind of struck me is that if you look at any mixture up there, Again, you know, it's the same three colors and they're used over and over and over again. And it's just the percentage of how much red, how much blue, how much yellow, you know, to get the varying range of color that she got. Um, so in looking at this, there's no, there's no way that that painting is going to be not harmonious with color the colors all work together because every one of them have those same mixtures you know to some degree okay so i thought that was a you know when i when i watched the video i thought that was an interesting thing about it that i wanted to bring out to you guys anybody got any comments about that eloise richard anybody yeah we, veronica well, I um, prefer realistic instead of impressionistic things. So it's a nice painting, but I probably wouldn't be want, doing one like that. It's interesting, though, that she carried three colors so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's a good deal of wisdom <laughs> in doing, you know, exactly that, you know, trying to, you know, trying not to introduce a lot of, uh, 
you know, a lot of other color into it and, and really making the, the color that she has right there in that limited palette, you know, work, you know, and work for all the different parts, you know, of, of this painting. Uh, and yeah, she could have taken it further. She could have brought it to a more realistic uh, and more, you know, finely tuned representational uh, look. But, you know, for her, you know, this is kind of her style. You know, this is this is kind of what she does. You know, it doesn't matter whether she's painting landscape or whether she's painting still life or portraits. You know, she simplifies, you know, uh, quite a bit. And uh, and it's, you know, you can learn a lot by just watching her process. Yeah. And, and, and yes. then, of course, you can you can push it as far as you want, you know, that. to make yeah. it your own. But uh, but, you know, what what she has to say and what she's doing in, you know, in the process is solid. You know, it's solid. It holds together and it makes sense. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else before we move on? I'm gonna watch it again because I like that it's it's simplified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think you were here. Maybe you heard it, but you know, again, and I I kind of side with Eloise and also with John a little bit. You know, I would have liked to have seen her add like you know, maybe two more values to the lemons and the leaves. And, you know, like a reflected light, you know, might help, um, you know, on both the leaves and in the lemons and maybe even in the bowl. And, uh, and that would have forced her to look at not only value, but temperature. And, you know, she could have really pulled off a really three-dimensional effect you know, on all of those objects, but, you know, for as, as far as she went, you know, I think she did, you know, a really nice job and a lot of people, you know, particularly collectors, you know, people like that would, you know, want to collect a painting like that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a is, nice... is this her, uh, her normal style of painting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's got uh, she's got quite a few videos on YouTube, and uh, in particular her landscapes. Um, you know, I've watched quite a few of those, and and she does pretty much so the same thing. It's it's all about, you know, taking, you know, what what's out there, and interpreting it within kind of a limited range of color, and value, and simplifying it. And she's she's very good at that. So which is why she's probably at, you know, uh what is it, you know, uh Realism Live and uh you know a lot of the other workshops and, and conferences um that you'd go to and and she's teaching at. So you know, again, you know, the the underlying concepts you know, and uh, and the approach she's taking is, I think, you know, very solid and very well founded. It's, you know, she doesn't take it nearly far enough for some people's liking, um, and other people, you know, um, you know, things, you know, kind of feel like she does just enough. And so, again, you know, it's it's an aesthetic choice. So, all right. So let's see. Next, we're going to we're going to see Mr. Chris Fornatero again. Um, so you want to make beautiful paintings, but how do you actually get there? Yeah, this is where I started, and I want to make you. Okay, so now this this is talking about his whole process with painting portraits, and. You know, I like Chris's videos. He's he's good at explaining what he does. Um, and again, he's one of these painters, if you look at his, you know, at, at his work very closely, he doesn't do a lot of blending. You know, he's relying on shifts in value and temperature to kind of sculpt out the form. 
but you know he definitely understands you know how to get the underlying form of the shape of a head you know down on the canvas you know before he starts you know noodling away at the details so you know watch this really carefully and uh see what you think I'm Chris Fornatero here to help simplify oil painting so you can get better faster. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you probably know that I've been chipping away at this big Nicolas Cage collage. So I thought I would take this video to show you how I paint one of these beautiful cages. Now, before we jump in, it's going to let you know if you like this video, if you like the channel, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. It really helps the channel grow. If you're looking for full video painting tutorials, I do have those, but they are on my Patreon page. Also, when you sign up to my Patreon page, I have a new feature. Anybody who signs up gets access to my private Facebook group where everybody that's a patron of mine is posting pictures of the work, sharing you know advice and feedback. It's so great. It's so cool to see everybody's paintings and to see everybody helping each other out. So if you want a way to show your work to other painters that are learning to and get feedback this is a great opportunity to do that and the link to sign up for my patreon page is in the description below and if you want to see what i'm painting on a daily basis like the nick cage painting here you can follow me on instagram at forza 43 now you're probably asking chris like why are you painting so many pictures of nick cage I don't know. I thought it'd be funny. You know, I wanted something to constantly be working on, so I'd always had something to, you know, be practicing with. And I got the idea of just putting a bunch of crazy pictures of Nick Cage all in one painting. And when it's done, yes, I am going to try and sell it. I'm also going to be creating uh, prints of it. So that's a good reason to follow my Instagram so you know when that happens, which is Forza43. All right, let's paint some Nick Cage. So the colors that I use to paint this are Ultramarine Blue, Elizabeth Crimson, uh, Burnt Sienna, uh, Cadmium Red, Yellow Ochre, uh, Cadmium Lemon, and Titanium White. And I actually use no medium in this, just paint and paint thinner. And it's painted on stretched oil primed linen. So the first thing that I like to do is just block out my darkest darks. Like these are the darkest accents that I can find in the subject. And I'm gonna do this with thin paint because I know I'm gonna be building on top of this, but I just wanna identify my darkest darks first. After that, I'm gonna do the same thing, but with a more general uh, shadow tone. I'm not so worried about nailing the exact color or the exact value right now. I just wanna be in the ballpark. I almost see this still as like a drawing phase. I'm just blocking out the light and dark shapes in the portrait. And the color I'm using here is like a very saturated purple. I find that I use purple a lot for my shadow tones uh, in portraits. I'll get a purple and desaturated a lot with a, you know, yellow ochre. You know, yellow is purple's complement. So if you get a purple, it's really vibrant. You're going to want to knock that down and make it look more natural. So that's kind of what I got going here. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing, but with the lighter shapes. And when I come up with this uh, light value tone, I don't want it to be too bright. If anything, I want to err on the side of it being too dark because I'm going to be able to build up the lights on top of that. It's a lot easier working dark to light than light to dark. It's just a lot easier to put lighter paint on top of darker paint. All right, so after I do the light shapes, I'm gonna actually find a value and color that is in between these light and darks that I have going here. And this is gonna act as a transition. I'm gonna put this a lot of places where my lights and darks meet to smooth the transition from light to dark. Now, this is still a very rough stage. I'm not getting very picky with my brushwork. You know, it's very rough. I'm using a big brush. I'm moving quickly, and this is still thin paint. At the beginning stages of the painting like this, I like to think of putting the paint on and moving the paint opposed to applying it, which is what I'll do later. So I'm putting thin paint on the canvas. I'm moving it around and pushing it and pulling it to where I want it to be. I'm going to move into the light areas and I'm actually going to find more specific lighter shapes within the light areas that I blocked out. Now remember, since I aired on making 
the lights a little too dark. This is going to allow me to build lighter lights on top of that, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to find more specific lighter shapes, which is going to help translate the form of the face. You know, we're trying to work with big shapes first and then go into smaller and smaller shapes as the painting goes on. I'm going to do the same thing and look for the more specific shapes in these shadows as well. Now, since I have paint covering the entire painting, it's going to allow me to bounce back and forth from lights to darks. I don't just finish all the darks and then move on to all the lights. I don't have set stages of a painting. I feel like a lot of people think that there's some set pattern or set sequence of steps for a painting there isn't so much of painting is laying down paint and seeing how it's working with the paint that's already down there and seeing what you have to adjust it's a lot of pushing and pulling i'll push my lights pull back with my darks go back into my lights it's a lot of bouncing back and forth and dialing everything in as the painting goes this is why it's very important to constantly be stepping back from the painting and seeing everything as a whole. Don't get sucked into just one area because you will get dialed into that one area and you'll be working and working and getting all this detail and be great. But you pull out and it's all painted in the wrong value and it just doesn't work with the rest of the painting. Now you'll notice on my palette as I'm mixing colors, I'm using previous colors that I mixed to start new colors. I'm branching off of colors. I'm using a color and adding to that to change it to what I want it to be. I feel that this helps me have color harmony within my painting. Now speaking of color, I feel a lot of beginners don't get enough color variety in their portraits. They'll kind of have an idea of what skin tones are and they'll be so locked and ingrained in their mind that it won't allow them to see all the different colors that are happening. There's a lot of different colors going on in uh, flesh tones. I actually don't even like using that term flesh tones or skin tones because skin tones are always different depending on you know, the type of skin, the type of light, it's in shadows and in the sun. Like it's it can vary so much. There's a thought of there being some generic skin tone or recipe to get a skin tone color i just i feel like that's an unhealthy way to look at it don't even think of that it that way you're just seeing a color and you're trying to match that color now example of a color that you might not notice is that a lot of times around the mouth there'll be a lot more grains that's because there's a lot more hair around the mouth even when you got a clean shaven cage like this there's still you know hairs there you can't see them but it's reflecting the light a different way and a lot of times that shows up as more of a green so you can see that i'm pushing the greens a little more around the mouth here it'll also be like kind of around the edges of the eyebrows the other thing is look for more reddish tones in the nose and the cheeks because i think it's like the blood vessels are closer to the skin there and they just tend to, to be more red it's things like this that you can look for to add a variety of colors in your painting try not to just have one flesh tone and then just dark darker and lighter versions of that one color. That can create a very boring portrait. Now the thing to look out for if you do have a bunch of different colors going on in your portrait is to make sure they're operating in the right value. Remember, value does all the work, but color gets all the credit. If you have all these great colors, if they're not in the right value, it's not gonna matter. Value is much more important than color, so if you need to, Take a picture of your painting and then put it in black and white on your phone to make sure you're handling all these different colors in the right value. Taking a picture of your painting and putting it in black and white will make it very clear what areas aren't operating in the right value. Now you're probably wondering, like, how am I laying down all this paint and not creating mud? You know, this is all wet to wet paint. You're probably thinking, man, if I was doing that, it'd just be mud and nothing would work. The reason that it's working is that I started out with relatively thin paint. And yes, the more you paint, the more you get experience handling the paint, the more you're gonna be able to make it do what you want it to do. But try and paint thin to thick. You know, when you're starting the painting, use thinner paint and progressively get thicker and thicker with your paint. If you want more info on that, I've made a whole video on painting thin to thick and I'll link that above right here. So towards the latter half of my painting, I'm using relatively thick paint and just laying it on over top of areas and it's laying down nicely because it's going over thinner paint now another problem that you might be having is that you might not be using the right type of brush I've noticed with a lot of the, my students that a lot of them aren't using good sturdy oil painting brushes there are brushes made for oil painting and they're made for a certain reason because they're they're strong sturdy brushes because oil paints pretty heavy and 
you got to be able to get a brush that can hold a good amount of paint, but also lay that paint down and apply it well too. Now there are a bunch of different kinds of brushes and brands and all this. For this painting, I'm using a lot of Rosemary & Co's ivory synthetic brushes. I really like Rosemary & Co brushes. No, they're not a sponsor. They're not paying for me for any of this. I just really like their brushes. And I actually made a beginner's brush set, like a very basic brush set. If you have no idea what brushes to get, I'll put a link to the video where I talk about that brush set above. So like if you were trying to use like a watercolor brush or you know some acrylic brushes brushes with very soft flimsy bristles you're not going to be able to pick up enough paint and put it down and really make a solid mark if you're not using a strong sturdy oil painting brush all right speaking of brush work try to avoid blending whenever you can now if you want a smooth transition between different values don't take a brush and feather it and try to blend them together instead Mix up a value that's between those two values and put it down between that to create a softer transition. Now, another thing you can do, if you already have values next to each other and they're already pretty close and you just want to just make it that much more smoother, you can take your brush and just kind of run it down where those two values meet and kind of soften that line that they create. I don't really like to consider that blending as much as just softening edges. Now, I always like to use a big brush when I can. For a lot of this painting, I'm using a flat brush, like a number four or number six. But when it comes down to detail, I do like to get out my ivory rigger brush. Now, this is a long, sturdy bristle brush that allows me to get in there and get nice little fine details. Details. So if the brushes you have now, if you struggle getting detail, check into looking to getting a rigger brush. They also work great for signing your painting at the end too. All right, so after about two hours or so, I have a completed Nick Cage. Again, if you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. If you want to follow the progression on the Cage painting, you can follow me on Instagram at Forza43. If you're looking for full painting video tutorials and a Facebook page where you can post your paintings with other painters that are learning like you, and get feedback that is on my patreon page which you can find a link to in the description below i'm chris fornatero here telling you to go get painting whoa okay any thoughts about that anybody I yeah i liked it uh I think I'll go back and view it again. It's portrait painting process made easy or something. What was the name of it? Oh, the actual, uh, let me, yeah. I think it was, you know, something about his complete steps. Oh. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a portrait painting process broken down. And, uh, you know, he goes under the name Paint Coach. His actual name is Chris Fornatero. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank but, coach. you know, he has other uh, portrait painting videos because that's mainly what he does is uh, portraiture. And mm -hmm. um, again, you know, if you, if you compare him to Claire Bowen, they actually paint in, you know, pretty pretty similar processes you know again you know starting with you know big blocks of dark uh you know fairly thin color and then you know keep building keep layering you know moving toward the light um and you know we talk about that process a lot but uh you know but it works and it's worked for you know the last couple thousand years so he also talked about adding in transitional uh color or value to right, right. instead of blending color. right right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and you know i mean there's if you look at the difference between say what uh johannes vermeer did with in his paintings and what a lot of contemporary painters are doing now uh you know vermeer spent a long time you know mixing his color and then putting in paint passages and then softening and blending edges. Um, so that really, when you look at a Vermeer painting, it's it's not like you can't see any paint strokes in it, um, but they're, you know, they're very subtle, you know, and you can actually see edges and things where he blended one color into another, you know, 
most contemporary painters um, don't spend a lot of time blending. Um, and there's reasons for that. And I'll be happy to explain them in a minute. But uh, what they do instead is, again, they, they build a string of value and they lay those values next to each other. And what that does is that, you know, sculpts the form of, you know, the shape of that face or how that cheek turns or whatever. And, and really that's what they're doing is, you know, they're not trying to blend one edge into another. They're, they're laying down a series of values. And as they lay it down, you know, they may shift, not the value, but say maybe the temperature or uh, the intensity, you know, in, in between those different separate uh, passages of paint so that you get this, you know, they really get that full effect of turning form on it. And that's, again, you know, how most contemporary painters work. Um, now, you know, why are people so against blending? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and here's why, okay? You can take a really nicely structured painting and, uh, and, and you know, have a painting with all the elements in there with the form. And the problem is that, that most people who are just starting out or really have been doing it for like 20 years, but have just built up really bad habits is that they over blend their paintings. And all that work that they did in mixing those separate, you know, colors and shifts in temperature and things, uh, when they start blending, they totally annihilate it. And, and totally just flatten the painting back out again, you know, by pulling all of those colors and raking them across, you know, from one side to the other. And and they lose the form. So, you know, I mean, if if you did the blending conscientiously <laughs> and really only took those two sections and pulled them together, and then clean your brush and went to the next one and did that one and then the next one, um, that would be fine because you would still hold that structure. But, you know, in my experience, and I know I've done it myself, you know, I've, I've watched me do it and, you know, you get, you're, you're there and you're having this great time, you know, working with the brush and pulling all these colors together. And it looks great on the canvas, you know, when you're like, six inches away from it but then you step back across the room and you realize that you just destroyed all the form that you just spent two or three hours working to build and it's it's all gone <laughs> yeah you know, it's just like ah. so that's why any questions about that no no you got it okay all right so, let's see who's here. So, Richard's here. Armando's here. Nam was here. Let's see. Eloise was here. Um, yeah, she's gone now. Is she gone? Yeah. She left the building. Okay. <laughs> Veronica and John's here. Okay. All right. And anybody got any questions about anything we've seen so far? You're so quiet. No questions until I get in front of a canvas and then turn it to muck and try to figure out what what just happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, the simple answer is, you know, in both of these videos, those were prime examples of how not to turn it into muck. Right. <laughs> See, you know, keep it simple. You know, and and. Like for you in particular, Veronica, like Claire Bo Bowen's approach. Yeah. You know, where she's painting, you know, and it's it's kind of flat planes, right? That would be really, really good practice for you. Okay. Uh, and just keep it simple and don't worry about, you know, taking it a lot further, you know, into some of those uh, more subtle nuances yet until you solidly get down, you know, the process of, you know, getting your shapes and your values. And then as you step back, you know, seeing the structure and form. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, and that's, you know, that really kind of goes for everybody here, uh, including me. Um, you know, because that really is key is, you know, if, if you get, if you can get it that far, then you've got a good solid foundation. And, you know, if, if you want to take it further, you can, but get to at least that stage, you know, where you've got, you know, good simplified shapes, a good solid value structure, good composition and good color harmony. You know, your, your colors are working together. Uh, and if you get that much accomplished, you know, it's been a good day of work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, let's see. Stop share. We don't want to stop share. We actually want to go to. Uh, this is what I've been wanting. Well, there's two. Um, let's do color strategy first. Okay. Color strategy. Yeah. With the same guy. Oh. Because I think a lot of times you guys think you need to use every color out there. What's well, one of the most powerful communicators Here. of emotion? Is the artist. Let's back her up. All right. And away we go. It's one of the most powerful communicators of emotion in the artist's tool chest. Imagine some of the world's masterpieces without color, and pretty quickly you'll realize its importance and its skillful use. For this reason, it's very important to study color strategy. And it all begins with a study of light and its relationship to color. The study of light actually dates all the way back to the time of Aristotle, who suggested that all color comes from black and white, or darkness and lightness, and that it was a gift from God in the form of rays of light. Scientific understanding slowly advanced over time, taking a big leap forward in the mid-1600s during the time of Isaac Newton. When he was only 23, and while in seclusion during a bubonic plague outbreak, Newton experimented with light and found that a ray of white light is actually made up of seven individual colors. How did he figure this out? Newton had isolated a single beam of sunlight by making a small hole in his window shutter. He then placed a prism in the path of the resulting ray of light, and when the light came out of the opposite end of the prism, it had bent and broken up into seven distinct colors. Newton called this range of colors the visible light spectrum, and we often remember it with the fictitious name Roy G. Biv. It refers to red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. After identifying and charting the dominant colors in the spectrum, he noticed that the two extreme ends had related hues. This led him to connect those ends, producing a circular model and what would later be called a color wheel. Newton's color wheel was based on colored light and only used those colors found on the visible light spectrum. But a few decades earlier, a different color system was being established as well. This was the primary color system used by artists, and it was based on pigments, not light. At its core were the three artists' primaries, red, yellow, and blue. The painter's color wheel begins by plotting these same three colors, which are then mixed together in sets to create what are called secondary colors. Then, one primary is mixed with one secondary to create what we call a tertiary color. These resulting colors are often hyphenated names, such as yellow-green. The completed color wheel can then be used to develop color strategies when painting. And there are several common strategies that have been used by some of the masters throughout history. Let me show you. To begin with, we need to learn how to examine the painting for color. When you look at a painting, 
You try to step back and take an all over view of the piece, identifying the main colors or hues. Don't worry about subtle tones and values. Think general color. Identify those that jump out and then look at their placement on the color wheel. It's always interesting to see how those colors were used. Your colors may be shaded with black, tinted with white, or toned down by a hint of another color. Try to look beyond those factors and choose where on the color wheel they match up best. It doesn't have to be perfect, just get close. Here's another example. In this wonderful piece by McEwen, you can see that the two main colors are red and green. Really, almost all the colors in the piece, other than grays and whites, are variations on red and green. So if you take away the gray and white, and then plot the red and green on the color wheel, even though they're very muted, you can see that they're complementary colors. This helps you see that there was thought behind the color planning. But it's also important to know that there are times when an artist doesn't strategize at all. They simply paint what they see in nature. And this often works out fine because the colors in nature are never off and they never conflict. It's one of the reasons artists throughout history have intensely studied nature. But there are plenty of times when you'll want to make adjustments, whether to achieve an effect or to communicate a feeling. And this is where knowledge of color strategies will be especially valuable. As we look through various master paintings, you'll notice that there are a lot of grays and neutral tones. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to consider neutrals, grays, browns, white, and black, as supporting colors. Those colors <laughs> used to build the painting, but not a direct part of the color strategy unless the chosen colors themselves are neutral, in which case they are the strategy, or at least a part of it. Grays and browns accentuate chromatic colors, so when they're included, it's a way to tone down the scene or to accentuate a chromatic color. Whites and blacks are used for value and to communicate feeling. They, too, help make chromatic colors pop or they give viewers visual rest. So when we look at a master painting or plan our own pieces, our color strategies are based mostly on the chromatic colors, those from the color wheel or spectrum, with neutrals used to support. Now let's take a look at several of the main color strategies and some masterpieces from history that appear to use them. We'll begin with the simplest color scheme, a single color or a monochromatic painting. Compositions that use a monochromatic color scheme use variations on that color, tints and shades. You use variations in chroma and value. Although I don't usually count black, white, or neutral tones when evaluating color schemes, since they tend to act as support, as I said, here's a case where white is the main color. This is a monochromatic piece by Klimt featuring white tones and a touch of black to establish the focal point. And then you have the quintessential monochrome painting by Monet. Clearly, this piece features mostly tones of blue for a very tranquil effect. Blue, remember, is a tranquil color itself, then used alone, almost, with a tranquil composition, and it brings home the feeling. Although a monochromatic painting could be in almost any color, the one that appears to be used most often is red, as you can see in these two paintings. There are also color schemes based on two colors, a dyadic color scheme, dyad meaning two parts. The dominant colors are derived from two colors that sit exactly opposite on the color wheel called complementary colors. This Renaissance era painting initially looks like it's monochromatic, but the necklace is actually a complement. Together with the skin tone, it subtly balances the dominant green. Here's another very subtle use of complements, red and green, a gorgeous piece by Sargent. Notice all the tonal variation. Both colors are subdued and muted, giving it a very earthy feel that's pleasing to the eye. And here's another subtle complementary color scheme, 
this time in warm blue and a pale peach. Black helps establish the focal point, but the color scheme is a soft complement for visual interest without too much punch. But notice the feeling that warm blue, almost an aqua, gives the wintry scene. It's an interesting choice of color. Friedrich's painting of a girl staring out a window is another good diode. I love this piece. And notice the wonderful balanced use of green and gold, although there's quite a bit of orange at the base. Still, I think we can place this one in the dyadic category. Colors can also be selected in groups of three. These are called triadic color schemes, tri meaning three. There are several ways to pick triads. First, the colors can be equidistant from each other, such as the use of three primaries. Or you can use a thinner triangle, referring to what we call a split complement. There's also something called a split analogous. This piece, created in the 1400s by Fra Angelico, is a great example of a triad, a split complement. Notice how he strategically places the boldest color, the orange, around the piece. It's very balanced, and the combination of the orange with gold and then well-placed blue complements makes the piece both pleasing and interesting to look at. This sweet little piece was painted by David in the 1500s. Here the mm -hmm. artist uses a primary color triad. Blue is the dominant color, but David uses gold in the grasses and a touch of red to balance the color scheme. There is green in the trees, so it could qualify as a tetrad, but to me the main colors, the primary ones, are blue, gold, and red, a triad. This painting also features a primary triad, but in this case Van Dyck uses it in a much more subtle manner. First of all, the white was selected for the Virgin, most likely to convey a sense of purity. The supporting colors make up a soft, gentle triad as well. Notice the toned down reds, blues, and yellows. It gives it a peaceful feeling. Another way to handle three colors is to create an analogous color scheme, where the three colors are adjacent. Analogous color schemes can involve three, four, or even five colors that are adjacent. They're all related in the sense, so they communicate a serenity and peacefulness. These are the calm and restful color schemes, such as the landscape we see here. I love this one. It's a beautifully rendered piece, and the three related colors that make up the bulk of the painting are really nice together. A gentle blue, a muted green, and a pale gold. Notice how they create a natural, tranquil feeling. And how about this piece, painted on the internals of a grand piano? This piano was in the White House during the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt in the early 1900s. It was painted by Thomas Dewing and features primarily muted but strong green, a very muted yellow, and a pale muted red subdued analogous colors that feel very harmonious together. And note their warmth. The colors sit towards the warm end of the spectrum, and together they feel warm. As opposed to this piece, another tranquil scene, but this time with a cool feeling. All of these analogous colors were selected from the cool side of the spectrum, giving the piece a harmonious but cool presentation. And finally, let's look at an analogous color scheme that features green as the dominant color, so you can see how that color impacts the viewer. Remember, green communicates a feeling of nature. Do you think the color scheme helps communicate that? The table appears to be a slightly cooler, much darker version of the orange in the fruit, but it works nicely. The dark value sets off the other colors. There are other color schemes that use four color groupings, and these are referred to as tetradic. There's a tetradic square, a tetradic rectangle, and a tetradic complement. Notice how each one is balanced. And we can see it pretty clearly in this painting by Caravaggio. 
Red dominates and is supported by muted smaller sections of gold, green, and blue. It's balanced and works well with the composition. A four color design can also be a tetradic complement. And the example I have for you is what I think is an astonishing piece from the mid 1400s. In an era where almost all the paintings feature a similar look and a similar color scheme, this artist breaks the mold and gives us this warm blue and orange painting, really outside the box. And if you've taken my brush strokes class, you'll appreciate the early, early use of impasto, as you can see in this image. A tetrad can also be very subtle, as in this piece by Turner. Turner was a student of color, so you know his choices and expression were intentional. Do you see the soft, muted blue, green, red, and yellow? Visually pleasing, but so soft that it keeps things subdued. And finally, this wonderful piece by Homer. At first glance, it appears to be monochromatic, but when you really examine it, you find red and orange and green and blue. The blue is very minimal, but it's in a significant position in her dress. So this, in my opinion, would be a rectangular tetrad. And take note of the color placement, the use of value contrast, and the use of chroma contrast. Bold, pure color surrounded by toned color. They're used to lead the eye. And as always, there are plenty of examples in art of masters who used color schemes that- That's Paulo Picasso, I like that one. These are perfect examples to teach us that rules in art are guidelines. We can work with rules, but we can also think outside the box. Not every design has to fall into a neat heading. If a color scheme works in your eyes, go for it. The importance of this is seen in the work of El Greco, whose colors are really different from anybody in his time. It makes his work stand out. If you enjoyed this presentation, you may like my three-hour online class on understanding color, where we take an in-depth look at color theory. Okay. A lot of information. Yes. <laughs> but it also kind of rattles your brain and makes you think. Hmm. Yes. You know? Maybe rather than just picking up a brush and start slapping color up there, maybe you want to sit and kind of think a little bit and look at a color wheel and kind of figure out what kind of relationship you want, you know, in color, you know, in that painting. And and how are you going to get there? And then trying to stick with that. So, uh, you know, it's it's worth thinking about. And if if you really look at you know the the, the old masters um, or any of the masters, if you want to go that far, <clears throat> you know the color that they used in their paintings was not by accident. You know they they had a definite intention in how they mixed and approached color, and uh, you know and it worked. You know, it works really they, well. They almost had an advantage by mixing their own. Well, um, yes. Yes. Um, in some degree, they did. You know, if you're going back to the Renaissance and things like that, they they obviously would make a base color like, you know, the the general... The general goal in mixing your color would be come up with as bright and as intense a color as you can make, because once you have that, you know, it's it's easy to tone the color down. It's yeah. very it's very difficult to go the other way. And uh you know, so you you know, uh when you look back historically there are a lot of paintings that were done by old masters that unfortunately are not going to survive 
you know, because they did end up mixing their own color. Uh, and they were primarily working in oil paint. Uh, oil has an innate problem with when you're layering oil paint and you're putting one layer of oil over another, you know, generally it will stick and it will hold together pretty well. As long as the consistency in uh, pigment to oil remains fairly constant. But, you know, when you're mixing batches of paint, like every other day or so, uh, to work on a painting, then some days you have more oil, some days you have less oil, and you get a uh, an issue where you're putting a drier, less oily layer of paint over, you know, something that is heavy in oil and not completely dry. And uh, And what ends up happening over time is it ends up cracking and peeling away from, from that bottom, that underlying surface, and your paintings fall apart. Either that or the oils go rancid and basically turn black. And that's, that's what's happened to a lot of the uh, Flemish paintings uh, that were done in the like late 14th through like the early 17th century. Um, you know, beautiful still lives, uh, you know, intricate, you know, beautiful color schemes, things like that. But, you know, the, the paintings didn't last, you know, because, you know, they, they all aged and, and the oil turned black. And unfortunately, with the oil mixed directly into the pigment, there's no way of, of you know, solving that, you know, and saving the painting. So, uh you got a lot of, if you go to Germany, uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, you know, places like that, you, you have a lot of paintings uh, that you look at that you would think it was an all black painting. But the fact is, it used to be brightly colored, but now mm -hmm. it's, it's all shifted. And there's not really anything they can do, you know, for that, unfortunately. So, wow. um. So living in the 21st century where you can go out and you can buy a product like a tube of Windsor Newton uh, paint and uh, you go back to the store and you buy another tube that's the same color, you're, you're relatively guaranteed that the level of oil to pigment is going to be pretty darn close, you know, if not spot on because they're, they're very careful about that. So the chances of, of Armando's painting lasting for the next 500 years is far greater than, you know, a German artist in the 14th century who mixed his own paint. So if I buy oil or any brand of those colors, they are the same. I suppose I buy emerald green. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No matter what brand, it would be the same? No, no. Um, you know, some brands that you'll buy will have a higher content of oil to pigment. Oh. Other brands will have, you know, less. Uh, that's why I don't like to, you know, mix and match different uh -huh. brands yeah. of paint. Uh, you know, like for example, I pretty much so use either Windsor Newton artist colors and or the Winton artist colors. Yeah, that's what I have here. Winston and Newton. Yeah, Win yeah, Winton. So I should stay in this brand. Yeah, I would either that or the artist grade, the Windsor Newtons, same company. And the level of oil is is pretty consistent throughout all of their products mm -hmm. so you can interchange them and use them you know pretty freely now if, if you go buy like another brand and there are lots of brands of, of oil paint out there today and in fact there's a lot of artists who are making their own series of, of paints and things and you try to intermix them with other manufacturers you know, you may get, you know, some interesting results <laughs> and some of them may not work out the way you want. So that's, 
you know, that's why I would kind of recommend staying with, you know, pick a brand of paint that you like, that you get a good color range out of that you can afford and stay with that. Okay. You know, don't, don't go out and buy, you know, 15 different, you know, oil paint manufacturers, because again, you know, you may open up a tube and squeeze it out and get a nice line of paint that's, you know, really nice and consistent uh, from another manufacturer, the very same color, you open it up and you squirt it out. And what do you get? You know, you get a big puddle of oil, mm -hmm. you know? So again, you know, it, it's like different companies have different recipes and some use a lot more oil, some use more pigment, some mm -hmm. use a lot of filler. Some use none. Um, so, you know, buy the best paint you can and buy something that is a consistency that you like the feel of, you know, when you're working with it and, and it has good color range and uh, and stick with that. You know, don't, don't go intermixing a lot of different stuff because, again, you know, the result may may look fine, you know, for a while, but uh, it may not hold up over time. So that's my speech on. All right. You know, oil paint. OK. So. And uh, anybody got any questions about any of that? No. No. OK. You got it. Huh? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to play one more video for you. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's one more. And then uh, and then we're all going to go away and have turkey tomorrow, right? <laughs> it's uh, a Christmas tree ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow you have to light up the Christmas tree. That's Atlanta tradition. Well, you know, I'm... To light up the tree on Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. Well, some, pe some people do. You know, personally, I could put up a Christmas tree like a week before Christmas and I'd be happy. Oh, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> so, I, so, I much, get... so much work and then you can enjoy. Hold on, I'll be back. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah. Where, where, where you have been? All right. So let's go to this uh, sacrificing detail for moody light effects. Now, this is James uh, Gurney, okay? We've seen his work before. Good artist. In this video, I'm going to paint this picture for you. It's a sun rising over a derelict furniture warehouse in eastern Long Island. I want to try to use this underpainting as a way of setting up this lens flare idea. So I'll make the lights lighter than the base color and the darks darker, but try to stay in the same warm key. The underpainting or priming color is done in casein, an old fashioned paint which doesn't reactivate when it's re wet. So that casein priming will be a good base layer for the watercolor and gouache painting I'll do over it. I'm using zinc white, azo yellow, pyrrole red, transparent orange iron oxide, Prussian blue, cobalt teal, and a little bit of ultramarine blue. Now I start to mix a tint of white with the yellow to make that sky color a little bit lighter than it is in the priming. My inspiration for this effect of light and color are the photographs you find on Instagram of the lens flare effects where the light eats through the dark forms in the scene and sets up a series of circles that are arranged on a diagonal axis from the light source. I'll start with a sky first and put some warm color approaching the white where the sun is behind the tower. Trying to keep it all wet together while I do this gradient. And now I can start to put in the roof of the tower. It's fairly light because it's close to the supposed sunlight source. It's hidden right behind that tower. 
that aggressively bright sunlight and the bright sky eats through all the forms, including the utility pole that is in the sky next to the tower. That dull orange on the tower is close to the color remaining from the priming nearby. I'm trying to hold this mental image as I look at the scene. I'm getting form ideas from looking at the scene here, but I'm changing the color according to this memory I have of an effect I've seen on photographs. Sorry, I'm back. I take a break and go across the street to get a closer look at the architecture of this Greenport Auditorium from the 1890s before the age of movies. Now, of course, stores furniture, but at one time, this must have been the entrance with these lathe turned sunburst motifs under the tower. Fish scale shingling. It's been a furniture store a pretty long time. <clears throat> I'm mixing a darker color as I get lower down and farther away from the sunlight effect. This will be some trees over on the right. And I'm using sepia, transparent orange iron oxide, and even a little blue as I get farther away from the light. It'll eventually get close to black farther away. And I'm dealing with these weird colors using a flat synthetic brush. Even though those are green leaves, I'm painting them red because they're near that hot sky. I like to have some really fine details in there, like these window crossbars. For that, I use a very thin synthetic pointed brush with some light reflected off that vertical window, picking up the light of the sky. And I start using some cool colors to paint the cars down here on the street. The cars are near black or navy, and the vertical planes are close to black. But anywhere that the planes face upward toward the sky, it'll be picking up the light values of the sky. So I save some white for the window, which is reflecting the sky in the distance. And switching to a light orange color for the objects against the sky, these little insulators are on the end of the wires. I look at where the wire is coming from and where it's going. Use a long haired rigger brush. Riggers are good for thin line work. And then that long flat for painting in some of the far street details. <laughs> so here's the final result, trying to get that idea of the lens flare moving through all the forms, both light and dark. Well, I brought the painting home. I'm looking at it. It's all that orange color and the orange in the sky. It's all sort of monochromatic. And I want to get some color movement. So I've got some ultramarine blue, some sepia, and some magenta, cool red. And I want to mix a dark color and do something that you're not supposed to do with wash, and that's glaze over it with a wet wash. <laughs> I know what's going to happen. It's going to melt all the color below, but I don't care. I just want to try something crazy here. So I'm going to mix a dark color kind of toward the violet range. And as long as I Put the color down, don't fool with it too much. It should stay there. So it settles into the pits. I can't go back and scrub this. I gotta lay it down one time and leave it. It's sort of beating up in a weird way. I gotta leave it. And let's let it get nice and dark over here. These far trees. 
sort of dripping down there in the middle. Okay, I could try to fix that. I want to lighten it up as it gets toward the top of that tower. So I'll use a thin air wash, mostly water, a thin amount of pigment. So normally you can't get away with glazing and gouache because the gum arabic binder is so unstable. And that would be even true if I was working on paper, but because I have the casein priming, that offers less grip for the layer of gouache. So it dissolves very, very easily. It's very fragile. Inside this huge storage center are canceled solar panels, which the U.S. government is now handing out for no upfront cost to Americans who want to. How about if I introduce some crosswalk paint in a cool gray as a contrast to all the warms up above? Should be in perspective going back. Now, I want to make the sky lighter, too. It's too orangey. And if I can take some, this is casein paint. I'll mix a tint of blue. And make it sort of semi-transparent, a little bit milky. Mix a little yellow as I get closer to the sun. But this way, the sky isn't so orange on the outside areas. The idea is I want to save the brighter orange colors for the vicinity of the sun. I can paint fairly loosely over that utility pole because I can always come back and paint the pole over the sky. So I'll just loosely paint over this not worry about, about the edges too much. A little bit of white, a little bit of blue. And I don't need to be very precise here. I can paint over the tops of the trees because I can come back later and paint the foliage back over the dry sky paint. This is something that you get used to doing when you work a lot in opaque water media, is painting across edges. The French had an idea called the theory of sacrifices in the 19th century. And the idea is you have to sacrifice information or detail in order to get a larger moody statement. As one writer put it, nature instills sentiments in the spectator through the selective sacrifice of details in order to improve the overall effect. So what I'm sacrificing here are the smaller details of the windows and the architectural details of the building. Instead to get the big silhouette with just a hint of smaller detail. Classic example of this theory of sacrifices would be the Song of the Lark by Jules Breton. And here's where the sun will be. It'll actually burn through the color of the wires, too. This should be some of the hottest color, the brightest orange. And the edge can even be fairly soft. Because you know how bright it is when you look at the sun and it's just emerging from behind the building. It almost hurts to look at it. And even... Soften that edge, rub it a little bit. And when that dries, I can come back with some pastel and make it even lighter. Here I've got an inbrush gradient, meaning I've got colors that are different on one side of the brush than another. It's sort of white on the right and orange on the left. If you want to learn more about inbrush gradients or gradients in general, I'll put a link in the upper right. It'll take you to the DVD and the download for my new video on gradients. Now let's go over and paint some more wires and clutter on the right hand side. As we look down the street, there's a lot of street furniture, as they call it. A lot of 
cables, wires, leaves, trees, all breaking into the sky and overlapping the bright glow of the sky in the distance. And now that I've got the sky laid down, I can come back in and put in those wires. I'm drawing that long line with a rigger brush, the long haired brush. It's mentioned in the description below. Now put your headphones on because I want to experiment with something here. There are two microphones capturing the contact noises. You should hear this on the right. And then I'll do something in the center. This is Carbothello Pastel. Would you like to hear a whole video that's just ASMR noises, just the sound of painting and no talking? Let me know in the comments. So now we have that violet color dropping down as a contrast with the bright yellowish orange. And hopefully that makes a little bit more of a, a movement of color that's more interesting. This is a Carbothello pencil. A little highlight along that wire. And some light on the street. some blue pastel. Gouache has enough of a matte surface that you can use uh, soft pastels or hard pastels to get interesting effects. Including these circular ghosting artifacts of the lens flare, which line up along this diagonal to the point of the sunlight just behind the tower. These are often seen as circular shapes against the dark background. Sometimes they're polygonal. And the more elements a lens has, more of these ghosting artifacts will appear. And they happen because of internal reflections within the lens elements. And you might ask, why put this into a painting? Because our eyes don't exactly see it that way just playing, just trying out this visual look that we accept as photographic and doing it as an observational sketch. And if there's one takeaway from this video, it's that a sketchbook can be a place for trying out crazy combinations of colors, combinations of paints, and light effects that you want to explore. It's just a playground for ideas. Okay. Anybody's thoughts about that painting? Too dark. Too dark? Yeah, I don't like dark painting. Ah. Okay. But it def definitely achieved the effect he was looking for. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting, you know, because he, he went out on location, you know, he did the actual live sketch. Uh, and even there, he was, you know, he had something in mind that he was working toward. And uh, the thing that surprised me about this was the glaze of the violet over the already existing sort of yellow color and how how moody you know, it shifted those colors. Um, it really gave it a very nice effect, I thought. So, yeah, I, I agree. Now, was it dry when he did that over a glaze? Yeah, he, yeah, because he did that back in the studio. So it, you know, it had dried, you know, for quite a while. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was completely dry when he worked over it. So. And the same with the pastels, it was dry when you worked over it. Yeah, for the most part, I think. Yeah. But, uh, 
What's your thoughts, Eloise? I'm sort of agreeing with Armando. I don't like dark pictures either, but okay. um, it he captured the I guess the appearance of it very well. In fact, it the details look more like uh, they look pretty accurate, and it it just seems that um, sometimes you can look at old pictures and they will look like that. And this looks like one of those old pictures. So he he was very very realistic in his. Uh, in his uh production mm -hmm. yeah i thought you know i i like the painting when he got to the stage where he was working outdoors from life you know and it was an okay painting it wasn't a great painting but it was an okay painting um but i thought you know at that point he had a pretty good solid painting and then when he came back into the studio and he started playing with it and particularly when he started talking about putting that glaze and, and he mixed up that darker violet to go over it, you know, it, it kind of my heart sank because <laughs> it's like, oh, there goes that whole thing. And uh, and and to just see kind of the way that it all turned out, you know, it was actually a good move to do that. You know, I, I think the end effect, you know, he, he got something that you're not you know it, it may not be a hundred percent accurate and photographic but it has a emotional feel to it that mm -hmm. feels good and feels it right like those old painting old pictures old photographs that you accidentally find in a drawer someplace yeah it it kind of really to me it's it's kind of like being you know and i kind of relate it to being in san francisco because when i lived in the city and you know just just as the sun went down and it would go go down behind an apartment building or something like that, you know, everything would kind of get like this, you know, it's like all the buildings and stuff would be sort of almost a dark silhouette with the sky, you know, being really light behind it. And that's kind of what this reminds me of. Uh, but yeah, that's just me. Um, Veronica, you got anything to say? Yeah, yeah, I do. When he when he did the glaze, I I think I had the the same sentiment like oh my goodness it's gonna turn all black and yeah. there's not gonna be any picture, uh -huh. but you know now it's like it's very interesting and yeah sepia looking like a sepia photograph I thought that you know that was the end result. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh what do you think of the painting overall? I mean, do you do you like the effect or? I do. I do like the effect. I mean, and it, it's it, he's working small. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, in a frame, I think it would be really, really nice. Yeah, yeah, it would. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and that's one of the things you know I, I like about his approach of working as well is that he experiments a lot and yeah. and he'll try really interesting kind of weird combinations of layering paint and stuff like that. Uh, but the effects that he gets in his work, you know, I think, you know, are, are really something if you, if you pay attention to how he got, you know, to that, it, it can inform you about how to play and experiment in your own sketchbooks. You know, and not to be necessarily afraid of trying, you know, something because again, you know, it's just something in a sketchbook. Uh, but you learn, you know, you learn so much by playing with that process. And sometimes you come up with, you know, unusual things that in a way it, it sort of influences the rest of your work. You know, and you you can incorporate it and carry it over into what you do, and and give yourself kind of a unique look that nobody else has. So, uh, you know. Excuse me. Have a good Thanksgiving, everyone. I have to leave. All right. Have a good Thanksgiving, always. Is, yeah. you, is you three ready? <laughs> no way. <laughs> oh goodness. All right. Okay. My, anyway. Well. I'm ready. I got yeah. two widows coming over tomorrow. 
You got what coming over tomorrow? Burning Widows. Oh, okay. Well, have fun. <laughs> oh, we will. We'll all go. right. Well, I, you know, that's about all I've got for today. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, I guess we will see you starting Monday again. Um, we'll be back on Zoom. So uh, anyway, thanks for taking the time. I hope uh, you guys picked up some good information, maybe got some good ideas. And you got four whole days here. Other than eating turkey, <laughs> you could actually maybe do some painting. Okay. But we had games yeah. to watch too, uh, Charles. Do what now? We had games to watch. Games? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. You know? <laughs> no spin the bottle, Armando. Right. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's single and he's got you know he's got uh, two widows so uh you know i guess if he wants to uh you can follow the links in the you know if he wants to spin the bottle i guess he can yeah <laughs> all right anyway i just wanted to say thank you all for coming and uh we'll see you guys on monday then okay have a good have a good thanksgiving be safe all right yeah, happy holidays everybody thank you bye bye, -bye.